Uh, good evening and uh, good morning uh, uh, to all of you, depending upon wherever you may be in this world. Um, my name is Ben Tashor, and I am the Li Kaxing Professor in Public Management of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. I am also the director of the initiative to create the Lee Kuan Yew School's Public Policy Institute for Environment and Sustainability, now known as PIES. Um, it is my great pleasure uh, to welcome you to the fifth webinar series, or as we're calling it, our fireside chats, where we're engaging uh, critical stakeholders who have um, insights and, and thoughts about the best way to build what we're calling and building a fit for purpose policy institute in ways that can help organizations achieve their goals. And today we have uh, wonderful speakers from leading uh, philanthropy organizations to give us their uh, um, ideas and thoughts in this fireside chat. Um, my job is to introduce to you our moderator uh, for the evening today, uh, Dr. Marina Canetti, who is a, is a professor in our school, the Lee Kuan Yew School, and who specializes in questions of global development, including the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, migration and environmental governance. Uh, her uh, biography is long and you can uh, peruse that on the website, but now I want to in the interest of time, uh, turn over the festivities uh, to my colleague, uh, Dr. Marina Kennedy. Welcome. Great, thank you, Ben, for the introduction and greetings everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon and good evening, wherever you might be located. The purpose of our conversation is to gain perspectives from the philanthropic community on how to work, uh, how the work of the Lee Kuan Yew School Public Policy Institute for Environment and Sustainability could align with the mandates and the work of major funders. It is a great pleasure to welcome a truly stellar panel to our virtual fireside chat. Joining me as part of the conversation today are Dr. Kelly Levin, Chief of Science, Data and Systems Change at the Bezos Earth Fund. Dr. Chunang Jiang, a Program Officer at the Ford Foundation China Office. Uh, Dr. Lee Risby, Director of Effective Philanthropy at the Loudest Foundation and Ms. Natalie Kennedy, Deputy Director at the Asia Philanthropy Circle. I will not spend time uh, telling you about all their achievements and there are many, you can read their bios on the website. I would rather spend the time talking to them about some very important issues related to how our Institute can work with them. But as a way to start our casual conversation, casual fireside chat conversation, I want to go to a somewhat oblique uh, angle and reference two news items from the world of philanthropy that have recently engaged all of us around the world. The first one is the Twitter exchange between Elon Musk and David Beasley the director of the World Food Program last month. In case you haven't followed the exchange, David Beasley challenged Elon Musk to step up and provide a one-time support of $6 billion uh, to support the 42 million people who are on the brink of famine due to a combination of the climate crisis, structural poverty, conflict, and the pandemic. Musk's response, and I'm going to quote here, was if the World Food program, program can describe on this Twitter thread exactly how 6 billion will solve world hunger, I will sell Tesla stock right now and do it. He then added that he would only provide the money if the World Food Program used, quote, open source accounting so that the public sees precisely how the money is spent. Let me give you the second news item, uh, which was actually in the news, I think, yesterday. It is about Mackenzie Scott and her approach to giving. 
in a nutshell, uh, McKinsey Scott, whose fortune is estimated at 59 billion, has stated that she is committed to giving her fortune away until the safe is empty, as she says. In her latest round of giving, she announced that she will not be revealing the amounts of money donated or the names of the recipient entities. Uh, to quote exactly what she says, I want to let each of these incredible teams speak for themselves first if they choose to, with the hope that when they do, media focuses on their contributions instead of mine, end quote. As you might expect, while many are saying that Scott is redefining the rules of philanthropic giving, others have criticized her approach primarily because it lacks the type of transparency that Musk demanded from his exchange with Beasley. Scott is redrawing the rules of philanthropy by foregoing the notion of donor or institutional oversight and instead implying that those who are recipients should have an unlimited freedom to use the funding as they see fit. I'm sure we can organize an entire panel just around these two news items. But for the purposes of our conversation today, and with the risk of oversimplification, I would like to posit these two cases as two extremes on the spectrum of philanthropic giving. At one end of the spectrum, funding is provided under very strict conditions for a very specific purpose and with high expectations for accountability, uh, not only by the funder, but also the entire world. At the other end of the spectrum, funding is extended without conditionalities or oversight, and with complete trust in the ability of the grantee to use the funds and deliver the desired change. So as part of their initial comments, I would like to ask my esteemed panelists um, to map out where their institutions fit on this spectrum of funding and oversight. Or to phrase this differently, imagine you're having a Twitter exchange with the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy talking about uh, talking with some top-notch scholars working at the intersects of environment, policy, government, and governance and conservation. What kind of leverage is there to either develop joint programming or how might key areas of research at the Institute fit with the specific strategy and funding objectives of your foundation? So I will Perhaps start with uh, Dr. Kelly uh, Levin. Perfect. Uh, that was a fantastic introduction, Marina. Um, and uh, I, I guess I should start by saying, to some extent, the Bezos Earth Fund is the new kid on the block. Um, we've been around uh, for just a little bit. Uh, um, those uh, that have really taken the helm of it have not been on board for more than half a year. I've only been uh, with the fund since August. So I think a lot of the questions that you posed, Marina, we're still figuring out. And actually, I just contacted Lee the other day for an interview to learn about his approach to this question. And I'm doing the same with um, uh, a, a number of different philanthropies. But what I can say is that um, I think it's somewhere in the middle, both that we will be incredibly disciplined in terms of the types of outcomes that we are seeking to achieve um, and uh, have high levels of accountability in terms of understanding how the money is being spent um, and what is a theory of change and objectives around that funding. And at the same time, I think given how messy the world is, um, we will be incredibly flexible at the same time to redefine programs um, because uh, certainly nobody would want to lock oneself into some kind of log frame five years beforehand just to learn six months down the road that it doesn't work. Um, and uh, I think that will be critically important. I think the other thing that you said, Marina, in terms of 
partnership in terms of defining things together. That is very much the spirit of the Earth Fund. Um, we um, are hoping to really put our heads together with grantees to think through how to be the most effective. Um, and I think that in some ways, our relationships with grantees will go so much further than reams and reams of paper on monitoring. Um, as long as we have a constant dialogue, get to know each other, trust each other, um, and can kind of course correct and learn from the process. So that's gonna be incredibly helpful. But all that to be said, um, we're still figuring this all out. Um, and I think these are the, the right questions to ask. And I guess just your last point in terms of um, the, the objectives of the center, I think one, one thing that would be critical for us is really honing in on policy effectiveness um, and understanding um, the underlying drivers of the sy systems that we have today, the situations that we face, the barriers, um, and in the examples, which honestly are few and far between where we've seen durable, large, large scale change, what enabled that to happen? What was kind of the special sauce that brought that together, the key drivers, and to what extent is there any kind of replicability? So that if we're funding restoration in Africa, to what extent can we learn where restoration might have worked well before and where it's completely failed? And what could we potentially have the hope of um, trying to design a program that is going to be effective, even while being humble that you know certain successes are going to operate in a certain time and space. So I think a, a focus on policy effectiveness um, would be incredibly essential for us. I'll pause there. I know that it's a bit of a discussion, so I'll come back with other thoughts. Great. Thank you very much for this. Um, you know, I, I pointed to you first because the exchange between Musk and Beasley was actually targeting also Jeff Bezos, but he didn't respond. <laughs> but that's uh, 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 a side comment. Uh, let me let me turn to uh, Dr. Chananjian uh, for for his comments um, on on his work with the Ford Foundation and how it looks from his angle. You're mute. You're muted. Uh, hello. Yeah. Uh, for Ford Foundation, and uh, we are more on the side of trust our grantees. And so once we select the grantee, and we don't have very detailed uh, financial control or uh, 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 discipline on spending, and uh, so uh, uh, we, we have some general rules and we have some auditing, but in general, we are more flexible. And uh, we will listen to the grantees, and uh, uh, then we can also make adjustments uh, uh, in the middle of the term if there are uh, any uh, changes in circumstances. For example, for the pandemic, and we have made lots of uh, changes in terms of uh, project extension and uh, 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 budgetary changes and some other changes. And uh, 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 so we are. Uh, 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 pretty flexible. And uh, we also have some uh, focus on institutional strengthening and uh, to support uh, institutions, institutions to strengthen themselves because we found uh, lots of uh, founders and uh, mainly support the project funding and uh, they don't have resources for the institutional building and for uh, capacity building within their own institutions. So we uh, provide some support and for the indirect cost. And also we have some general support or cost support for institutional uh, uh, strengthening uh, for some of the key grantees. So this is on, on, on the side and we we are more uh, I trust our grantees. And uh, uh, a second uh, uh, for, for Ford, we have a structure and uh, we have the headquarter in New York and the headquarter here has a big US program and also have some uh, global programs such as um, NRCC, which is uh, natural resources and climate change, and uh, on uh, women and girls, and on civil society and the government. And we also have uh, uh, 10 regional offices 
and uh, for example, in, in Asia, and uh, we have uh, China office and uh, responsible for China. We have Indonesia office, mainly for Indonesia. We also have India office that covers uh, India, uh, Sri Lanka, and Nepal. And then we have four offices in Africa and uh, 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 three offices in uh, Latin America region. So, and uh, then uh, regional offices and have uh, uh, sometimes and uh, have its own programs and sometimes uh, select some of the global programs. And uh, so, for example, in terms of China office, and we have our own programs, and we also support uh, have close links with NRCC uh, as a headquarter because uh, seven of our regional offices select the NRCC as their main topic for support. So uh, then in China office, and we, we, uh, we have a number of uh, uh, non of work and on China and the world, and we are concerned about uh, China's influence on the world and uh, in terms of China's BRI and uh, China's engagement with uh, global institutions and uh, also China's impact uh, mainly in the uh, 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 local communities in the global South countries. So that's, that's uh, how the thought works and in our ground making. I stop here, thanks. Great, thank you very much. Um, I will come back to, to this question of how do we think about different countries and, and different spaces when we are talking about climate change and the environment and sustainability. Uh, but before that, uh, with my earlier puzzle on uh, philanthropy and, and the spectrum of giving, uh, let me turn to Dr. Lee. Thanks. So, you know, where are we on the spectrum uh, that you outlined? And I was thinking about a couple of quotes, actually, as you were talking last year, you kind of ended towards the trust side. I think it was Ronald Reagan that once said, trust, but verify. Um, I don't think we're like that. We're not a, a, a kind of, uh, we don't in, indulge kind of uh, Reagan-like think, thinking about uh, philanthropy. I think what is important to loud us with our focus on climate and inequality, arguably the two most complex and greatest crises of, of our time, is that we want to work with our partners. We don't call, we don't call them grantees, we call them partners because we want partnership um, with other organizations. Um, we want to learn and we want them to learn. And uh, you know, in order to do that, um, you have to have uh, some systems in place to enable uh, a structured an, or an architecture to allow learning to take place um, or accountable learning, as I call it. I want people to be accountable for their learning. I don't just want accountability and learning, um, which is kind of traditional kind of evaluative um, uh, theory that one uses um, uh, in philanthropy or even in the World Food Program, uh, drawing on your example. So you know, for us in practicing philanthropy, we want it to be effective. It has to have goals. Um, we have to have a strategy in place um, uh, that says, you know, how are we going to get to the goals that we've outlined? And, um, you know, we need good implementation, um, whether that is providing programmatic support to our partners or general operating support, unrestricted financing um, with mission aligned partners. And uh, with that, um, you know, a, I think a healthy amount of assessment and learning which is based on um, valuing what is important to measure and evaluate and learn from, from both our perspective and our partner's perspective. And by doing that, you actually build trust by setting up a, um, a kind of right-sized measurement uh, and evaluation system that people buy into, um, rather than being imposed uh, from the top down, which I think, you know, traditionally, um, monitoring and evaluation or measurement and evaluation has traditionally, has traditionally done that. So we wanted to get away from that perspective. And I'll, I'll stop there at this point. Great, 
Thank you very much. And there were a lot of tidbits that we can return to in, in our next round, but, but let me turn it over to Natalie for her comments. Thanks, Marina. Yeah, I always learn a lot from Lee. I was taking notes too. Um, so APC, we actually are a platform for membership. Um, so our members aren't really a monolith. So to your first question, we have a huge range, um, which we find really fun because the whole purpose of APC is to help philanthropists and philanthropies find one another. And to do that, they need to find people who they can work with to collaborate with. So it makes sense. There needs to be a diverse set of approaches. So we have members who are very careful about, it sounds like the way that Mackenzie Scott is going, um, where they use something called controlled transparency, uh, or they're very, very mindful about when they would use their name. You know, what is the intention of putting the weight of their foundation's name behind announcing um, a grant or a partnership? And we have some who are determined to stay very, very low profile for very, very valid, valid reasons. They're maybe operating in very sensitive spaces. Um, governments are often skeptical, perhaps, of, of foundations operating in those spaces, so they try to keep a, a polite low profile. And we have some younger members, we do have some next gen, who understand that in climate in particular, they need to take a leadership role. So they're happy, they're uncomfortable at first, but they're, they're happy to, to find a way to have a more public profile. Um, so a real, a real range, and I think restricted versus unrestricted has been pretty well covered, but we've got that range in our, in our membership too. Um, I think we've talked a little bit about your second one, which was around how to partner, but I think in the interest of just sort of getting to the discussion, I think what I would love to address is when you talked about the objectives of the center, um, the policy environment in Southeast Asia is so fragmented. And so I think I would echo what Kelly said, which was, you know, learning what were the enabling factors that permitted great change to happen. And I think there are some examples in South Asia and Southeast Asia, but they are not well documented. So I think the center could really play a role here in developing case studies that really articulate well the role that philanthropy played, if it played it in a significant policy change. So something like um, the transition away from coal in the Philippines, you know, philanthropy played a really interesting role in that. Uh, and it's just, it's not publicly documented particularly well. So I think the, the research that you generate could, could really uh, contribute to a, a real gap um, in the knowledge space. Right, uh, that's wonderful. And, and I actually didn't know that uh, Philippine case either. So we are on it. We're definitely going to do some research on it. Um, and, and so let, let me, uh, since you're, many of you mentioned partnering, um, I would love to hear more um, kind of in, in the spirit of what Natalie just mentioned. What are some concrete ways in which we, um, our institute can partner with you and uh, how can we work together um, on, on various projects or uh, policy or fit for purpose policies for this region and for the world overall? Uh, maybe, maybe we can start again with uh, Kelly. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that um, we certainly, and I imagine everybody here, want to work with um, the best thinkers on how to solve the global crises that we're facing and that we all want to affect change on. Um, and in doing so, you know, nobody's going to solve this by working by themselves in front of their computer. Um, and it is really around partnerships um, and learning from one another. Um, and I think depending on how the center is set up and the research objectives, um, I think to, to the extent that it can be designed around critical questions around priority setting, effectiveness, overcoming of barriers, um, and be as decision relevant as possible, and maybe kind of shake up the incentive system for researchers to churn out two to three page really dumbed down memos as opposed to peer reviewed literature in, in inaccessible language. It would be interesting 
to see if the center could be designed in a way that really does better arm a partnership, uh, kind of more like a think tank. Um, and in so doing, I think that there are tremendous opportunities for partnership. Um, I think that we are quite keen to work with the leading experts on the topics um, related to where we choose to invest um, and whether or not that's nature conservation or food systems or replacing the internal combustion engine. Um, I think it really will in part be a question of, of what you choose to focus on, um, but broader principles in terms of um, effectiveness of interventions, I think could apply to any number of areas. And um, we certainly would be really, really keen to soak up everything that you guys produce. Stop here. Great. I think all of this is music to Ben's ears right now. <laughs> um, all right, let, let me uh, jump over uh, and, and turn to Lee for, for his views on partnership, because I, I think he's the, the person who sort of gave us the, the partnership word very strongly. Um, and I would like to ask him the same question. What is it that he's looking for uh, when, when, he, um, when he works with partners and, and how can we be a valuable partner for, for the type of work that you're doing in the foundation? Okay, um, in our areas, I'll give you some examples of, uh, or one uh, example, Laudus, Laudus's strategy, um, particularly as it relates to kind of reimagining uh, the financial system um, is focused on this area called new economic thinking, um, or you know, uh, new economic policy. Um, how do you re, uh, reimagine uh, monetary or fiscal policy or even macro prudential policy uh, and right size it um, for uh, the challenges that we now face? And my colleagues and uh, my good colleague, uh, Kelly Clark, who leads our uh, finance and capital markets team, has all the detail on this. But we partner with um, uh, um, uh, leading thinkers in this area, people like Mariana Mazzucato, uh, Kate Rayworth, um, who are leading um, think tanks in Europe. And we're really looking for innovative thinking uh, and to, to think beyond what was, what is the present normal or the old uh, ways of, of uh, thinking about economics in relation to uh, solving the climate crisis and inequality. Um, to you know, push thinking and bring up uh, new solutions uh, to these problems, whether it's uh, in the fields of uh, fiscal policy and taxation, um, or uh, whether it's um, you know, focused on um, thinking about uh, kind of rethinking and reworking social protections on the inequality side. So, I think for the mo at the moment, we're very much focused on uh, Western Europe in our geographies. Um, I think it would be interesting to, uh, to see what thinking is coming out of uh, um, Southeast Asia on these issues. But it also, the one other thing that I want to kind of bring into this is that, you know, this is obviously very current in Singapore before coming on to this, uh, this panel today. I looked at the news and yesterday uh, in the Singaporean news, uh, Mr. Lawrence Wong, who I believe is a, a member of government, said that Singapore is carefully studying the uh, context on, on when it can achieve net zero emissions, um, before, obviously before setting a target. So obviously at the moment, there's a very fertile um, policy space um, and action space that um, uh, people like yourselves can walk into and inform uh, government policy, whether it's economic policy, environmental policy, or um, social protections related to um, climate and uh, inequality. And he also spoke about inequality as well after that quote. So um, 
there's obviously a lot of fertile ground in Singapore at the moment. Yes, definitely. Uh, definitely. A, a lot of conversations could be had of, around how Singapore uh, features in, into both environmental sustainability, the type of work that is being done, uh, very innovative, I would say, on, on many levels. Um, and, and also how it, it wants to be a leader, of course, in, in the region on, on environmental issues. Um, so we can definitely contribute a lot in, in that area. But let me turn to um, uh, Dr. Chang about, uh, to ask him on, uh, what is it that we can be doing to support your work? And especially, uh, uh, you mentioned China's global rise, um, China's Belt and Road initiatives. These are areas that are very much monitored for environmental sustainability and, and, and the type of impact that they have, especially here in, in Southeast Asia. And so how can we work with you? Um, how, can be, uh, how can we be of support to you in, in the work that you're doing? Yeah, um, uh, for our strategy and uh, um, uh, China's, uh, we call China's development of finance. And we look at uh, uh, the impact of China's development of finance uh, in the communities of the global South countries. And in Asia, the, the main uh, country of concern is Indonesia. And uh, we also noticed uh, and, uh, uh, China has lots of investment and uh, development and norms in other uh, uh, Asian countries and uh, Southeast Asian countries, especially like uh, uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, North, and uh, the Philippines and some other countries in the region. And uh, so, uh, so we, we, we look at uh, especially the, the, the social impact and the impact in the communities and with like uh, uh, impact on women, on, uh, on disabled people, on the uh, 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 indigenous communities of those countries. And uh, uh, then uh, there also have been some uh, uh, impact on the climate change and how can you do adaptation and uh, cl uh, climate governance. And we are concerned with the, the uh, 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 extractive industries like mining, and uh, uh, to some extent, uh, uh, deforestation and the deforestation for for the uh, for farming practices and on the farming communities. And uh, so that has been a big issue, especially in Indonesia, to some extent in Papua New Guinea and in some other uh, Southeast Asian countries, and also in Latin America. Uh, I think uh, given you are in Singapore, and uh, so probably I think uh, Southeast Asian countries will be the focus. And uh, we have worked with uh, a number of ground chiefs and, um, on, on those issues, and we have organized some network of uh, ground chiefs and uh, for webinar programs, and policy dialogue. We have also supported uh, uh, some uh, think tanks to produce report on China's development of finance with the impact in those countries. And we also doing, uh, uh, we also help the global source countries to generate knowledge about China. The approach is uh, for the impact of the Chinese development of finance in those countries. And uh, one way is to work on the financial institutions and investors from China and to strengthen China's financial regulation and from the perspective of ESG and the social dimension. And the second approach is to improve the, the regulations and the standards in the global source countries, for example, in Indonesia. And if there would be more regulations and the legal requirement, especially on that ESG and the standard, and then the Chinese investors and uh, tend to, to uh, 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 to 
uh, uh, Abelou and Abel, the regulations locally. So we work from two sides. One big issue is uh, there's a net communication and understanding between Chinese investors and uh, the local community in the global talks. So how can we improve their awareness about the uh, Chinese uh, 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 laws and the financial regulations and the regulations and the guidelines in terms of uh, investment in the global South countries. That would be a big step forward. And so we, we are uh, supporting uh, uh, some think tanks and uh, uh, China study centers in the global South countries to generate the knowledge about China. And we understand that uh, it is very hard for them to understand China's institutions, policies, how the system work, and uh, what are the state-owned enterprises, what are the are the policy banks in China, and how can they work with them? And uh, if they have a, a complaint, and how can they get their back to, into the investors or back into the policy makers in China? So that's uh, the work we are, we are doing at the moment. And uh, uh, so uh, we also supported uh, some uh, uh, think tanks in US to produce reports uh, about uh, China's debt issues. and. Uh, uh, China's debt in Africa countries and some of the uh, Asia countries, and uh, also report uh, uh, to uh, mapping and analyze China's development and finance in global South countries. And so that's, that's what we're working. And uh, generally, we are not uh, supporting the policy changes and or some of the improvement in global North countries. So we are more concerned about global South countries. But uh, in a sense, some of the think tanks and uh, in the global north countries and, uh, have some role to play in the process to help the global source. And uh, uh, also we support some Chinese think tanks and, uh, uh, and the universities and, uh, to generate knowledge and uh, to have some uh, exchanging uh, programs and visiting scholars, webinar programs with their counterpart in the global source countries. So I'll uh, uh, pause here. Yeah, that, that's really great. And I, I've been smiling so much because uh, within the Lee Kuan Yew School, we are uh, trying to work on a lot of the areas that you uh, mentioned, particularly understanding of, of Chinese investors and um, kind of South-South understanding of what exactly is, is China doing in, in some of these countries. So uh, a conversation that definitely can be continued. Uh, Natalie, I, I want to turn to you, since you brought up the, uh, the philanthropy Philippines case, I wanted to run uh, by you uh, the four pillars that the center has identified to get a sense of what else we could be adding um, to our pillars of, uh, of research. So these very broad four pillars are climate and energy, circular economy, biodiversity conservation, and water and oceans. What do you think uh, needs to be added to this or what within those pillars would make sense for us to focus on uh, in order to support uh, or partner further with, with you and your members? Yeah, I, I, I talked to Ben about this a little bit. I think that I, I wouldn't add to that list. I think that that's an ambitious set already, um, especially because there's such a gap in the region. But I think for what we hear from members in the region is that it's more about the how. So we talked to philanthropists about the different levers of change. So many of them work at the community level or the market level. And very few of the Asian philanthropists that we've worked with are comfortable at the policy level. Um, it's, it's hard in Southeast Asia um, and it's really fragmented. So especially if you're looking to do transboundary, it's, it's difficult to have a single approach. So I think in climate, you know, given the scale of the problem and the time that we have, that's the most important lever. So I'm delighted that the center is being set up and focused on this part. I think Lee and Dr. Cheng, you just mentioned, you know, the, the need to contextualize for the global south. Um, I mean, Kate Rayworth is doing that right now, isn't she? So 
I think it's great for, um, it's, it's really helpful for foundations in Southeast Asia to see good examples of um, philanthropically catalyzed policy change. As I mentioned, if you could contribute to that space, but it's also helpful for them to understand, you know, the importance of, of the policy lever. And I think, you know, Vietnam's a good example of that, right? It went from being a problematic uh, country in terms of the pipeline for coal, and then it's a superstar and rooftop solar overnight, <laughs> you know, and, and um, just a great example in the region of what, what effective policy can do. So I think showcasing some of that would be really helpful. And I, the convening role um, is one that the center could definitely play. So in ASEAN, it's something that we have done at APC. So we hosted, when Singapore chaired the ASEAN Secretariat in 2015, we hosted the first um, ASEAN Philanthropy Dialogue. And it was to get at this, to get um, policymakers in conversation with philanthropies, um, because that lever is so difficult on both sides. Uh, neither side knows particularly well how to do that. Um, and so we, we, we played that convening role and we had a really good response that was not continued as the secretariat rotated, but I think um, the center could certainly play a convening role in that way, which can help to uh, address the issue of fragmentation. Um, even just landscape studies of the state of different policies in the region, you know, around even, you know, carbon pricing, carbon tax. I don't know that that's been, that that's been, um, done very recently. So I think that that's definitely a role that the, the center could play. Great, uh, thank, thank you so much for this. this. These are very insightful comments. If, if I might turn to Kelly and, and Lee for their comments on, on the same question of um, here are our four pillars, uh, what is missing? What should we be adding? Um, is there anything in particular that that uh, makes sense for us to focus on more? Um, in case you're disagreeing with Natalie, of course. Um, so, so let me repeat the pillars again, climate and energy, circular economy, biodiversity, conservation, and water and oceans. So Kelly, what, what is your sense of uh, what would be your uh, kind of first pick, or is, is there something else that, that you would rather us uh, work on? Thanks. I, Lee, do you want to come in? I saw your hand raised quickly, so uh, let me invite you in first, and then I can come back. Yeah, I'm, I'm very much in Natalie's camp, that you've already got quite a lot to get your teeth into uh, in those areas, whether you just stay within the confines of Singapore, or whether you look more broadly across the region of of which Natalie has much more knowledge than I do uh, in that uh, regard. I mean, I think just to kind of, one of the things that I think is always good to kind of watch against is that, um, you know, what may be working at a policy level in one country um, cannot necessarily be transferred to another. And I think a, a lot of philanthropists are always looking for this, um, they're always chasing scale. Uh, you know, scanning up something from uh, one area to another. Um, and, you know, from my previous career, which I spent mostly with the World Bank and the African Development Bank before moving into philanthropy, um, as an evaluator, um, we always said, you know, co context, context, context is the main thing that determines, uh, one of the main things that determines um, whether you get impact or not. And, um, very often things don't transfer from one country to the next. So that's one thing that I, I think um, one can keep an eye on from your point of view as a, a, a research, you know, provider of research is to highlight um, the context specific, um, specifics of certain uh, impacts across your areas of interest. Um, and the other is to, uh, to go um, where, you know, some of the major gaps are, you know, you mentioned circular economy. At the moment, which is um, extremely fashionable uh, in, across many industries, yet many uh, industries and companies are struggling uh, in terms of how to integrate circularity into their supply chains. And you know, what are the um, financial and economic costs and benefits 
of doing so, given that um, in many areas, uh, companies will need to go circular, uh, you know, in the next uh, five to 10 years to have um, a good chance of hitting their targets for net zero, amongst all the other things, actually. So, you know, that, that would be another area, um, I think, which would, uh, which gives some good, good focus. Um, and by addressing that, arguably, you're addressing some of the other issues that you're uh, interested in, be it climate or biodiversity. Back yeah, to you, thanks. Kelly. I, thanks. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with Lee and Natalie. Um, this is a um, big amount of work to, to, um, to tackle. Um, if anything, actually, you may want to uh, start a little bit more narrow, um, have success with that, and, and then adopt others. Um, because, you know, you could have a thousand people working for you guys and not even scratch the surface on these incredibly large topics. Um, I guess the topics all, of course, resonate. Um, some of the largest challenges, I mean, in some ways, they're a little bit apples and oranges because I kind of think of circular economy as, as a means, a vehicle towards addressing climate, addressing biodiversity issues, et cetera. So you may want to kind of nest that in as you know, one critical approach necessity uh, for addressing some of these other challenges. Um, I also think that freshwater and ocean systems are incredibly different. Um, so there might be a danger in lumping those together. I mean, obviously, there's a place in which those mix together, but the the pressures um, on freshwater versus oceans are are very very different um, in most geographies. So uh, it it may make sense just to separate those out. Um, and then I also wonder to what extent on the freshwater uh, on the on the ocean piece are you addressing issues related to biodiversity related to climate change? Is it related to mitigation? Is it related to adaptation, et cetera? In some ways, um, you almost have the kind of twin crises of climate and biodiversity. And then there are the ways in which you approach those, whether or not it's kind of the, the underlying sectoral transformations that are required, et cetera. And you can think about those also in the way in which we manage our biomes, terrestrial biome, a freshwater biome and a marine biome. So it, 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 may, it may actually be good to simplify it and take climate and biodiversity or climate and nature, whatever you wanna call it, and then have certain aspects of that that you focus on. One might be related to oceans, what have you. I guess the, the only other thing that I'll say is that in choosing the particular topics that you focus on, I would be as problem driven as possible, meaning really go after investigation around interventions for the largest challenges. Um, so in mitigation space, for example, that would be defined by you know, abatement potential. So that is a question of um, looking at certain sectors and subsectors over others. So if waste is 2% of emissions, I'm not sure it makes sense to dedicate you know, a team of researchers to focus on how to deal with waste um, unless there are incredible lessons learned for other systems, um, which Lee has already cautioned us against that there's little um, transferability. But Lee, come in, I see your hand. I said something provocative. Well, it won't be that <laughs> provocative. I mean, it's only the, the, okay, look at the context in which you are um, surrounded by in Singapore, it's a city state. Um, after all, and um, you know, again, with my loudest bias, um, you know, one of the other areas we, we operate in is the built environment, and we know that the built environment regulations on buildings is very much determined at city level, um, and of course, with rapid urbanization, which is going to only continue as we move towards um, a population of 10 billion, um, Singapore has. Um, perhaps some opportunities to lead, uh, to do some interesting work and lead the way on what does the right policy environment look like in the built environment, given that also the built environment constitutes about probably, you know, they say it's about 30%, or maybe it's a bit more than that, of emissions. 
So, um, you know, going back to, Ke to Kelly's point, you know, go where there is the energy uh, and, and where there's the strength and the contextual relevance. Um, also to uh, the government uh, of Singapore as well, and how you can how you can inform some of their as uh, some of their steps towards net zero, as as, uh, um, as Lawrence Wong was saying yesterday, they're still thinking about it. Yeah, thank you. This is really uh, great and very insightful. I want to um, make sure that there are no questions from the audience because we are moving towards the end of the conversation. So any question? I don't see any questions in the chat. Is there any other way that we would know? No questions from the audience currently. All right. Uh, Okay, let's let's then continue. I have a, another question on my list that I want to pose to you. And this is the question about uh, technological innovations, uh, which of course also Singapore is very keen on um, using a, a tech approach to solving uh, climate uh, problems or biodiversity problems. And so the question is, how much should our center, in your opinion, focus on uh, science and engineering and carbon technologies and solar panels? Um, maybe I'll, I'll turn to Dr. Chan first, since this is also uh, an area where China leads the way. And so um, what do you think? Is this, is this an area where uh, the center should develop some expertise uh, and is this something that um, uh, the Ford Foundation is, is, is also working on? Uh, for, uh, for Ford Foundation and uh, we, we are not uh, working on the technical issues and uh, we are more working on the, the social issues and uh, we want to have a, a better social and environment uh, impact and start to uh, uh, raise the goal to reduce uh, inequality. And so that's our goal. And we pay more attention to the communities. And uh, uh, so uh, <clears throat> then I think uh, for the climate change and uh, uh, biodiversity, and uh, as I understand uh, this is um, a sort of issues we need uh, a more interdiscipline and a comprehensive approach. For example, we need some technical expertise and we also need the uh, economic analysis and the financial and investment approach and uh, uh, also uh, understanding from the, the sustainability and uh, from the uh, natural resource protection point of view. So it's quite uh, complicated. We need uh, technical expertise, economist and, uh, and financial specialist uh, and also legal specialists to tackle the problem. And as I understand uh, for some of the think tanks and in China and elsewhere, and when they're dealing with sustainability development issues in global source countries, and they involve the expert uh, from different disciplines to, to, to uh, organize a team and uh, uh, expert uh, from different areas and uh, to attack, tackle the problem because this is all the new issues and uh, you are concerned with, uh, i just to give an example. For example, if you want to, 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 to uh, protect the uh, resources in the communities and uh, growers of countries like in Indonesia. And then you need to consider about uh, uh, the livelihood of a small uh, household. And you need to consider uh, how can you resolve the natural resources with natural resource account. And you need to uh, 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 look at the impacts of soil and on soil, on air, and the pollution, and uh, then uh, also look at uh, some of the legal issues in, in, in Indonesia and uh, international uh, norms and standards and in terms of ESG. And then you also need to look at the investors and some other aspects. So it's a more comprehensive approach. And so you need an expert team to solve the issue. 
to 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 uh, combine technical issues and the economic uh, finance and uh, and the legal issues and the resource issues and uh, deal with them in, in a package. So this is uh, to the new approach. Uh, so uh, this is one. And the second, uh, and uh, I also try to uh, answer some of the questions you posed before. For example, and uh, what uh, what what you might do and uh, to to do this and uh, climate change sustainable development. And uh, as far as Singapore is concerned, I think uh, as mentioned, it's it's uh, a, a small city state. And but I think uh, Singapore can play a big role in terms of uh, uh, East, Southeast Asia countries. And in terms of Southeast Asia countries, uh, uh, co cooperation with China, with some other uh, uh, Asian powers, and also with some other, other countries. And uh, then I think uh, uh, Singapore is also become sort of hub for finance and for impact investment in Asia countries. And uh, if you want to deal with sustainable development and the climate uh, crisis, and then you need lots of investment. And how can you mobilize and using the impact uh, or blended finance approach as an approach to solve those issues? And I think that uh, is unique to many of the uh, policy and the practical issues. Great. Um, I will give um, the rest of the panelists an, an opportunity to answer the technology question if they want, if anybody has any thoughts on this. Uh, yes, go ahead, Kelly. Yeah, thanks. Um, I guess in my mind, it's kind of a both and. Um, I, I think we know that technological innovation is going to be just speaking on the climate side, really critical for reaching net zero emissions. And on the one hand, in the next decade, that's largely achievable with readily acceptable technologies, and yet they still need to be embraced. And how that happens um, is a question. But by mid-century, there was a study by the IEA that many of you probably saw that almost half of the emission reductions that are required are going to require new technologies. Um, and that's really an, an innovation in r and agenda that needs to happen. And it needs to happen sooner than later so that you have kind of a fighting chance of those technologies being available um, in three decades time. But at the same time, technological innovation doesn't just happen. And it is driven by a number of different forces from public and private spending to individual leadership um, to kind of new advances in science um, and some of the underlying drivers that would be relevant for affecting any kind of change are still relevant for technological innovation. So I think looking, even if you were to embrace a technological innovation question or agenda in your research agenda, it could not ignore everything else uh, because technology doesn't just happen in a vacuum. Um, but yet at the same time, I think it's incredibly clear that technological innovation is not gonna get us to where we need to be. First, you know, it's, it's not incredibly relevant to all of the different sectors that we're dealing with. I mean, if you look at stopping deforestation, this is not gonna be a technological solution that is going to allow us to do that. Um, so I think one would need to think carefully about the problems that you seek to address and the role of technology in that and whether or not there are a kind of what are the major transformations that are required? Um, what role does technology play in any of those? And even if technology plays a large role, what are the underlying factors that are going to allow technology either to advance or to scale? Great, thank, thank you for this. Lee, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just kind of go on and echo what Kelly has said. I think you know, it's easy to be seduced by uh, technology and fall in love with looking for uh, technological solutions, many of which already exist. They just haven't been, they haven't gone to scale um, yet. And there, we do need new ones, of course. But you know, my immediate thought again is looking at from your perspective, uh, sitting in Singapore is, 
you know, Singapore has been a hub of innovation, arguably, and, and uh, since the 1960s. And so what is, you know, what's worked um, on innovation so far in, in uh, Singapore? What's the current policy uh, framework and, uh, uh, and system there? Where are the gaps? Um, and, you know, good policy analysis and good evaluation of uh, existing policies should give you some of the answers uh, and some of the ways in to influence uh, in Singapore and beyond. Um, I think that's also something that philanthropists is going back to something uh, else that uh, Kelly and Natalie touched on earlier. There's something that philanthropists are always looking for, um, uh, also in terms of understanding context and where to um, where to deploy their resources. Great. I, I think this is a, a very good segue into a question that was posed by an audience member, which is, there was a mention on gathering the philanthropists and policymakers to fill the gap. Could you share your thoughts on how an institute such as the PPIES can fill the bridge between philanthropists and companies or corporates? Maybe uh, I can turn to Natalie for a first crack at this question. That's a great question. I love that question. And it's so necessary in Southeast Asia because so many, um, so many businesses, so many families have had wealth creation um, from problematic industries. And so we have, we have members and then there are plenty of examples who are not our members. So of dual hats that they might wear. So often philanthropy is, is, is very compartmentalized in, in Southeast Asia and probably many other places where it's separate from the business. And I think what we're seeing increasingly is really brave movement in that front, which is a willingness to own the two hats of your family business and your philanthropy and they're becoming more integrated. Um, a lot of these are not in the public domain. Um, but we're aware of them and some really interesting things that are happening that things that are happening that actually relate to your tech question, uh, Marina, which are around decarbonizing these tricky industries. Um, so I think some of these conversations are happening. I think they're just not in a public domain. So to Peter's question, I think that that is a wonderful role that the center could play, which is providing a safe space for these conversations to happen. You know, how can philanthropy partner with business so that you can establish centers like the one in Singapore that was just set up um, by several families here looking to be a global center for the decarbonization of, of um, the shipping sector. Um, you know, and we have other members looking at ways to decarbonize uh, mining, which is obviously um, huge in Indonesia, in Australia. So I think these safe spaces will be very important because there's so much backlash against what's perceived probably rightly um, as greenwashing in some cases. And so I think we need to be careful about uh, these conversations so that they can be productive um, and move things in the right direction. It might take a while, um, but we can start to move things in the right direction if we can start to, to integrate those conversations as if, if philanthropy can be um, a partner to the transition that needs to happen across many of the businesses in Southeast Asia. I don't know if that answers, but that's a start, hopefully. No, I, I think this was a brilliant answer and, and so many ways in which we need to, uh, to work on all of these different aspects that you're sharing. I see that Lee has his hand up, um, so please go ahead. Yeah, just to follow on from Natalie's uh, examples. I mean, Loudest Foundation, we, we are focused on uh, the fashion industry, finance and capital markets, and the built environment, because uh, uh, the family behind us, the Brennick Meyer family, they're involved in those three areas, those three industries or sectors, whatever you want to call them. And, um, you know, we want to work um, uh, with and through business and industry uh, to, you know, encourage change. Uh, and, you know, I think, push in the right way for those changes to, uh, to take place, to uh, decarbonize uh, more effectively and efficiently 
and then also address some of the very knotty uh, social equity issues and inequality issues that we have at the moment. And I think that's the brave way to go for a, a kind of a philanthropist, perhaps who's, uh, who um, a family that has you know, earned their money in industry. They should you know, uh, you know, always try and look at how they can change the industry in which they've earned their money. Not many philanthropists do that, but you know, maybe we can set a new fashion on that in that regard. Great. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, Kelly or, or Dr. Chung, any comments from you on, on this question on bridging the gap between philanthropists and policymakers? And uh, uh, this reminds me uh, a project that now we are considering to support. And, uh, and China have that, uh, has that. Uh, uh, New goal of uh, common prosperity and uh, launched uh, this year, and then uh, that common prosperity is related uh, to some part to the philanthropy sector with that uh, so-called uh, third uh, distribution. And uh, the first uh, distribution is the market distribution. Second is uh, uh, taxes and the government expenditure. The third is with the philanthropy industry. And, uh, uh, to, to achieve common prosperity in China. So and, uh, we are supporting, uh, 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 we are considered to support a uh, university in Zhejiang to look at the pilot and to see how the financial peace sector in the province and uh, because uh, the province and the host uh, some big uh, 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 giant uh, internet players like Anibaba and Ant Finance and some other uh, uh, big uh, uh, companies in China and they all have their funding and uh, the issue is one is to look at uh, how the, their foundations uh, works and uh, uh, to achieve uh, to contribute to common prosperity in China second is uh, to look at uh, how the government uh, policies especially policies related uh, to taxation and uh, to, uh, to uh, government expenditure to encourage financial sector to, uh, uh, to make more contribution and to work more effectively towards common prosperity in China. I think uh, this is a, a similar issue uh, uh, for your institute. And uh, uh, how can you and, uh, do some um, the policy advocacy and the analysis and to make the financial peace sector and contribute more to climate change and to uh, sustainable development? Great, thank you. Thank you for this. Um, Kelly, any thoughts on this before? Yeah, I guess I, I guess it, it just, uh, I think it probably depends on the issue at hand and to what extent, whether it's governments or companies, to what extent are they being ambitious in line with the science and need support to be able to do what they've committed to or whether or not they need to be pushed to, increase ambition. Um, and if it's the former, if you take you know, the 30 by 30 initiative, for example, of, of protecting 30% um, of, of land and ocean by 2030, where we have been doing some significant um, grant making in the last few months, there, that's a situation where there have been governments that have embraced 30 by 30, need support to do it. And that is truly working in partnership with government um, we've met with heads of state to understand their needs um, and truly working in partnership with other governments who are also trying to support, say, the, the Congo Basin in terms of achieving their goals. There are other times where um, you might need kind of more of an outside pressure strategy where it may actually make little sense to partner in such, in such a close way with the government. Um, and actually, it's a very different set of actors that are needed to be able to um, affect change. Um, because if you were just to kind of adopt the priorities of whether or not it's private sector or public sector, it may actually not lead you to an ambitious agenda. So I think it probably just depends on kind of defining the most relevant actors to the question at hand. Yeah, and, and that gets into uh, another question that was posed on how do you engage stakeholders? 
but unfortunately we are uh, moving very close to the end of this panel so instead of answering the question on stakeholders i want to ask you a different question was there anything that you thought you will be talking about or expected to be sharing today that you didn't have a chance to to share as part of the conversation and maybe let's reverse the order and start with natalie first i'm so glad you asked that so yeah marina you, you threw us for a loop these were not the questions we were given but um so I'll just tell you what I said to Ben, because I was trying to understand the purpose of this panel. And I said, let me see, is this about how can philanthropy work more effectively with governments in the region? Or is this how can philanthropic flows be more easily dispersed? You know, how can we simplify some of the policy constraints? And so I think I was really hopeful that um, the center could address the latter. There are so many structural issues with um, philanthropic flows in the region in terms of sources of funds. So the issues that a foundation or any other giving vehicle will have, um, and then also deployment of funds. There are issues both ways. And, um, and I'd love to have more conversations with your team about that, especially with our members and figure out what we can do to kind of remove some of that friction. Yeah, but I love the questions that you asked. Don't get me wrong. This was really fun. Thanks. <laughs> no, I, I and I love this uh, last task that you're giving to us. It, it's wonderful. Um, let's move to Lee. Anything that uh, should have been discussed, anything that should have been asked, uh, or you expected to talk about that um, that you didn't have a chance to. No, I was. It was, a, it was a good discussion. It was nice to get some questions that, as Natalie was saying, which weren't on the uh, on the sheet. So uh, it was nice to be pleasantly surprised. Um, yeah, I think just coming back right to the very beginning, you touched on the issue of transparency in uh, philanthropy, which to, to me is still quite uh, a, a big one. There are varying levels of transparency um, in uh, according to region, according to country, uh, philanthropist, whatever way you look at it. And, um, and often transparency around what the results of philanthropic endeavors are. Um, um, philanthropists are not always the best at uh, uh, revealing their successes or dare I say it, even their failures. Um, and there's quite a, a, a gap really in, in the kind of study of philanthropy. Um, so that, that could be one area I think where you might want to uh, um, get involved and maybe even form a, uh, a partnership with Natalie over on the other side there, um, looking into um, how can you do philanthropy better um, and what is effective philanthropy within the South Asian uh, context, given um, these crises and given we're running out of time uh, to address, and we need you know, philanthropic uh, dollars to be spent as effectively as possible. This is fantastic. I love it. Um, it's really great. We should have another panel, <laughs> a follow-up panel. Um, Dr. Chang, any um, thoughts from you on things that should have been discussed or asked or something that you expected to speak about that you didn't have a chance to share? And uh, I think uh, this panel is mainly about uh, financial people and uh, the role uh, philanthropy will not to play and, uh, in that uh, climate change and some other emerging issues. And uh, uh, also in terms of uh, uh, for, for your institute and uh, uh, what uh, uh, philanthropy would need and from, from or public or whatever. So, and uh, I think uh, one issue we did not talk much is about uh, uh, the another function philanthropy can play, which is try to leverage and uh, other capital into development, and especially giving uh, 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 for sustainable development. And there has been a lack of funding, and uh, the current donor funding is far from sufficient to meet the development need. And not to mention. Uh, the funding to fight the climate change and the pandemic and some other urgent issues. 
So the, the current finance bill funding is very small and in terms of the, the growing need. So one big issue is how can finance be funding and some of the uh, aid fund to leverage uh, investment, especially investment from private sector to solve social problems. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this. Kelly, last but not least. Uh, thanks, Nara. It's been such a terrific um, discussion, Marina. Thank you so much. And, and thanks, Ben and all for inviting us. Um, I think the, the one thing that might be interesting just to look into are examples of effectiveness of centers and think tanks and academic institutions in communicating their research to policymakers, to philanthropy, to the private sector, both in terms of the definition of the problems that, that are kind of on the agenda for, for research, um, but also uh, the types of kind of formats, outputs that people will soak up in convenings um, and kind of what is most effective in terms of um, reaching your desired audience. Because I do think that sometimes the academic incentives are um, don't necessarily result in the type of um, outputs that will get these incredibly important findings uh, to those that are gonna be making decisions based upon them. Um, so that would be an interesting separate um, question of inquiry of, of effective communication and engagement and partnership with these different audiences, but kind of more from, from your guys' end, uh, because what would be criminal is that you reveal tremendously um, insightful findings, but they never actually hit the desk of those making decisions. That's right. Well, on, on that note, and um, how to make sure that our work is effective and, and hitting the, the right places and the right people. Um, I want to thank you for in, engaging with us on this very important conversation. I think our hands are now full. Uh, you've expanded our agenda uh, tremendously in, in very exciting new ways. Um, I, I will be in touch with you. If Ben is not, I will be in touch with you, I promise. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for taking the time. Um, enjoy your morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you might be. And thank you, everyone, for joining our panel today. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.